Yes, yeah, so welcome again to the UHI Archaeology Institute's research seminar, um, where we try to invite exciting speakers that we want to hear. So you can imagine how excited we were when we um, have uh, now got the, the Grave Goods project on the program. And uh, that project consists of these three lovely people that I'll now introduce. Anwen Cooper, who's a senior researcher with the Cambridge Archaeological Unit and specialising in Bronze and Iron Age Britain and Ireland. And then we have Melody Giles, who's a senior lecturer in archaeology at Manchester University, specialising in Iron Age and landscape archaeology. And then um, number three uh, is Hugo Anderson Y. Mark, that many of you will know, a senior curator in prehistory at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, where he holds responsibility for that wonderful collection uh, of Paleolithic, Mesolithic and Neolithic artefacts that they hold. OK, so I'll hand over to our speakers now and I'm looking forward to hearing all about the Grave Goods project. Thank you ever so much, Raggy. And it is an absolute delight to be with you, even if it is just virtually. Um, some of you will know I was your external examiner for the undergraduate courses for many years. Um, so it's lovely to be back with you to talk about research for a change. Um, I'm here very much representing um, the Grave Goods team. And today we're going to cover a little bit of the main project and then talk to you about the follow on project, which we are um, in the um, uh, throes of right now, which we would actually like some help with um, towards the end. And so um, we're each going to take turns. We're going to um, chip in where it's relevant and draw on each other's expertise and very much hope that you have lots of questions to ask, ask us afterwards. So the Grave Goods project um, involved myself and Anwin, um, but also the uh, main investigator on the project was Professor Duncan Garrow from the University of Reading and uh, Trina Gibson. Um, and our British Museum co I was the wonderful Neil Wilkin, a very busy man with the Stonehenge exhibition at the moment. Um, um, this was an AHRC funded project that um, ended uh, in April 2020. Um, and we set out to explore what we bury with the dead during prehistory, looking at the Neolithic through to the end of the Iron Age, um, uh, focusing on six case study regions from across uh, Britain. Now, the Grave Goods Project takes its title, obviously, from the things we bury with the dead. Um, but the title was a deliberate pun in that we wanted to bring those things to light, um, uh, to make them literally matter. Each of these objects was selected to be buried with the dead for a whole host of reasons. And whilst it is often the golden glinting ones that catch our eye in the museum case, our project set out to look at the whole panoply of objects that people chose to include with the dead. So we aimed to build a database of all material culture found in formal burials during these periods in the six case study regions you can see there. Cornwall, Dorset, Kent, Gwynedd, East Yorkshire and Orkney and the Hebrides. And we began with the HER data, um, which was the starting point for a, a greater synthesis of research and antiquarian data from these regions. What we wanted to do is explore patterns of regionality, looking for similarities and, and differences for long term trends. Uh, many of us will have a kind of a, a model in our mind of the peaks of grave goods when they came and went. But we wanted to put this on a firm statistical footing by looking um, across these regions and comparing and contrasting them. Some of them were famous for their grave goods throughout this period, notably East Yorkshire, but others we knew had these particular peaks. Um, some had very few grave goods, others many. And so by building in these contrastive regions, we hope to gain a snapshot um, of grave goods through time. But we were determined right from the start to include within this the full material assemblage caught up in burial, not just those items which previous archaeologists had classified as grave goods. 
So mindful of the fact that things like coffins and shrouds and wrappings can actually be the most significant object given to the dead. Um, we put all of this stuff back into our database, um, conceptually then using its positioning and its relationship with the dead to discern different motivations and reasons why it might be included in the grave. We were also interested then, as we explored those data sets, in thinking about what previous archaeologists had meant when they used the term grave goods, and then trying to rethink conceptually what those objects might have meant to people in prehistory. Our determination right from the start was to make this data meaningful in a variety of ways, to enrich it so that scholars coming back to it uh, through the HER or through museums would have the very best of the data that we could pull together. And our database is now freely um, searchable and accessible through archaeological data services hosted by the University of York. We wanted to produce narratives. We wanted to maybe tell a few different stories that hadn't been told before, but we also wanted to reach rather different audiences through a subject matter that we felt really um, could make a difference to how people understood prehistory, but also perhaps understand other dimensions of their own lives. So we have produced a series of articles. We were particularly captivated by the custom um, and tradition of wrapping, covering and containing the dead. So we have um, an open access article with um, the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society on this theme. Duncan, Amwin and Trina also became interested in um, the way in which our grave goods lie at one end of a spectrum of depositional practice, um, only some of which are interred with the deceased, but others occur in locales that look very like grave goods assemblages and yet don't get classified as funerary deposits. Um, so you can find that conceptual debate wonderfully outlined in archaeological dialogues. Our book, Grave Goods, um, is hot off the press. You can buy it for a very reasonable price as a lovely hardback um, with the wonderful front cover by our, our colleague Rose Ferriby. But you can also read this book for free and download it as a PDF. And because we wanted this to have an impact beyond academia itself, right from the start, we um, uh, set out to design a teaching pack for school teachers at primary school level who teach prehistory but often are struggling for resources. Um, so you can download our schools pack from ADS um, and to captivate their imagination and to make our research meaningful, we approached the wonderful Michael Rosen, um, a children's poet that all primary school teachers love to use. Um, and all primary school children love to listen to. Um, but Michael has another side to his writing, which some of you might know. Um, the sad book produced as a kind of a, a reflection on the untimely loss of his own son um, and, and touching on really moving themes of bereavement and loss. Um, and we knew this was a poet that could write for children about big, deep themes. Um, fortunately, he said yes, and you can listen to those poems through Michael's own um, website um, or again, read those poems in our teacher's pack. To complement those poems, we invited three different artists to work with us on visualising different aspects of burials, one Neolithic, one uh, Bronze Age, one Iron Age. So we worked with um, the wonderful uh, Rose Ferriby on the Neolithic. Uh, Chiku Tsuwada on the Iron Age and uh, Kelvin Wilson on our Bronze Age illustration. And at the end of the project, we took some of those stories and translated them into an exhibition trail at the British Museum. Um, physically, that doesn't exist anymore, but you can uh, tour it virtually and still find those stories online. And finally, we took that enriched data and sent it back to our HER records. So we hope that by the end of the project, we've reached a variety of different audiences in meaningful ways that ensure the longevity and sustainability of these research outputs. This is just a taste of our British Museum Gallery Trail, for example. Um, we didn't have much money, we had to be creative, um, so stickers were the way forward. Um, and here we have stories that we crafted, speaking to rather different themes um, inserted into a trail around the British Museum. 
And this is just a, an example of the way in which we uh, uh, have a holistic circle between our different data sets, um, enriching our understanding of that primary data we culled from places like Canmore and um, our um, uh, HER records um, and fed that back through into those records. Um, so what difference did we make um, by the end of the project? Um, one of the things that happened is that we began to kind of change the language of the way in which we describe these uh, phenomenon. Anwin, do you want to speak a little bit more to this one? Oh, I think you might be on mute. And when I think you can still unmute, even if you're not the, the presenter, yeah. Okay, thank you. I was just going to say here that um, one sort of interesting, unanticipated upshot of our work on the Gravers project is that um, when we tried, when we handed data back to historic environment records across um, England and to Canmore in Scotland, um, we found that we couldn't find the terms that we wanted to use for grave goods in the vocabularies that are used across the heritage sector. Um, so we proposed to um, Historic Environment Scotland and Historic England that maybe some new terms could be added. Um, and this is a process that's ongoing. Um, but hopefully in future, um, you will find in the fish vocabularies, as they're called, that are used across the heritage sector, um, object terms like mace head and um, chalcolithic early Bronze Age at beaker rather than just beaker generally, which can include Roman beakers as well. And also grave good specific objects. Um, so grave pillows were previously only allowed in the medieval period, but we came across many grave pillows um, in the prehistoric period. And also fossils as objects and pebbles as objects rather than just eco facts as they've been called previously. Thanks, that's all I had to say. Thanks, Samuel. So, yes, yeah, so we hope we've, we've begun to change some of the very language people use to describe um, discoveries um, because of the meaning we have kind of made out of those um, objects. So just a few results to uh, whet your appetite and, and send you scurrying off to look at that uh, monograph on our papers. Um, we looked at um, over a thousand sites, over 3000 graves. And within them, nearly well, three and a half thousand bodies and over six thousand objects. Um, so it really was a huge data set for both Trina and Anwin to bring together. And we're very grateful for all of their hard work. I'm sure Duncan would join me in thanking you for that as well. Um, we had to be selective, of course, and one of the questions we often get asked is, is why these case study regions? Um, we didn't mean to set out to do coastal regions, but I think it's quite curious that, that all of these areas um, are in um, places where we can explore connections, not just um, from coastal areas to inland areas, but um, perhaps uh, maritime relationships. And, and that was curious to us and a complement to some of the case study areas studied by projects like the Inglade project, which um, Anwin had already been involved in. Um, of course, this is a massive data set to start with. We couldn't explore all burials, um, only those with grave goods. And um, even when we come to the Neolithic, actually describing what is a grave and what is a formal burial and deciding what objects belong with which people, if any, um, was a complicated business. So there were many moments of discussion along the way in terms of what was ruled in and what was ruled out. Um, and the Neolithic remains a, a, a period that we um, continue to struggle with in terms of this relationship between peoples and things. And we've written about, about that quite explicitly in the book. Um, but here we can see a broad set of patterns, um, some expected spikes, of course, you know, very quiet in that earlier Neolithic period. Then we have our, our major spikes of both graves and grave goods in the um, late Neolithic, early Bronze Age period, but a rather unexpected spike um, cropping up in the Middle Bronze Age. Um, and it's particularly Dorset that surprised us with its data there. Um, very, very quiet in the early Iron Age uh, to the Middle Iron Age, as you might expect, before our explosion 
um, in that period. And again, it's East Yorkshire particularly playing a part there before Kent and Dorset really show some interesting patterns right at the end of that late Iron Age period. Um, so this is just one of the ways in which we worked um, uh, uh, with um, different ways of visualising that data. This is um, a heat map um, uh, of different object types, um, trying to show the coming and going of different types of things over time. So within the project results, if you're fascinated by weaponry or jewellery or um, quernstones or pebbles and stones or fossils, hopefully we'll be able to show you some of the kind of the peaks and troughs in the appearance and disappearance of those objects. And again, there were some little surprises along the way here. Um, so again, Anwin, do you want to talk a little bit about your Middle Bronze Age surprises? I was just going to say there's there's lots of patterns that you can pick out of this plot. You could spend hours looking at it. Um, we we just uh, plotted our uh, our top fifty ob object types in our database. So those are listed um, on the left hand side, and then we've got a timeline along the bottom. Um, and this this little um, blip here that I've circled in red um, is the Middle Bronze Age. Um, and what's interesting here is how pared down grave goods become at this time. It is literally almost all pots and lids in this period that we get and most the vast majority of those are in Dorset. So next slide please. Um, and this is the other thing that I wanted to point out in that very elusive period um, around the turn of the first millennium BC when we hardly get any grave goods at all. What's interesting is when you do get grave goods these are often very touching um, and personal objects, armlets and bracelets, covers, shrouds and wraps pendants, pins and points. Thanks. Lovely slide. So you can see here some of our regional patterns, um, uh, uh, East Yorkshire, um, you know, kind of remaining a constant um, uh, presence throughout the data set. Um, the particular peaks in places like Dorset, um, in that Middle Bronze Age, that was a, that was a you know a lovely data set for for Anwin to mine. Um, but again, coming to the fore through the Durrah region ripes in the later Iron Age, um, Kent obviously quite quiet um, in comparison through most of this period until the late Iron Age kind of uh, formal kind of um, in, uh, cremation rites um, once more um, really um, dominate our late data set. Um, so Gwyneth. Quiet throughout um, Orkney and the Outer Hebrides with its own particular trends, um, some of which we'll unfold for you in a little more detail through a, a couple of lovely case studies. Um, and here we can see um, uh, something of the temporal sequence in terms of the extension of grave goods and the real clustering of um, uh, objects per grave um, over time. We can see here uh, the most dominant trend is that there are uh, more diverse suites of objects with people in the later Iron Age than at any other period. Um, uh, and fewer objects, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, with people in that late Neolithic era. So um, this is our book. And uh, we're now just going to talk you through two or three of our favourite themes that we have written about in some depth, which maybe complement the kinds of narratives that others have told about these objects in the past. Um, these are the chapters um, uh, from the book. So um, we've introduced the project um, and then um, we've written a historiography of grave goods, which we hope um, particularly students might find fascinating. Um, we've looked at the big data patterns um, and uh, explored the grave good phenomenon in comparison to other kinds of material trends in chapter four. And then we have um, four nice interpretive chapters, one on the uh, understated objects we found in graves, one on the most common grave good of all, the pot. Um, we've explored material mobility in chapter seven and how grave goods allow us to examine temporality in chapter eight. So just a few ideas from our historiographic canter through um, past approaches to grave goods. Obviously, one of the um, best known accounts uh, or reflections on why things might be buried with the dead begins with Thomas Brown's urn burial or hydriotaphia. 
um, which when we went back to, we found, although it refers actually to the early medieval period of grave goods, was a remarkably sensitive and um, reflective account of different motivations that Brown could um, tease out from both archaeology and some anthropology in terms of the motivations of, of why the dead needed things or why the living wanted to give things to the dead. And Brown, of course, was living in a period of high mortality. And in his account as a doctor, you can sense this reflection on the enduring um, palpable materials that lived beyond human beings. And that was a concept that we found our early antiquarians going back to and reinvigorating in the 1840s to the um, 1880s. But of course, those antiquarians were driven also by avarice. We couldn't ignore that. Things became not just uh, economically valuable, but they became part of the cultural capital of these gentlemen scholars. And yet they too were often going back to some of Brown's ideas and reflecting on their own um, experiences of death and grief and contemporary burial rites um, amongst their own communities, but also amongst um, other ethnographic accounts that they were reading. And whilst they were puzzled by this strange habit of um, giving things to the dead, it defied their Christian belief, it defied their economic logic. One of the things that we found in the work of people like Thomas Bateman, um, John Mortimer, um, was a, a kind of understanding that this was their way of showing material affection for the dead. And that this was a concept that we found quite useful to think with as we moved forward. In the later part of that antiquarian era, of course, we see an obsession with craniology, with race, where grave goods get recast as the identifiers of different ethnic groups. Um, and so that was perhaps a less um, uh, 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 a less glorious part of our um, treatment of grave goods, where they took the back seat in comparison to human remains. Um, before they took a new centre stage in culture history paradigms. Um, again, as a kind of proxy often for the kinds of people uh, we believed were being buried with particular burial rites. And yet as culture history took hold across the middle part of the 20th century, we were also fascinated by the work of figures such as Leslie Grinsell, who was not swept up either in the new processual attitudes towards charting degrees of social evolution and class and status or the legacy of culture historical approaches, but was turning instead to things like folklore, drawing on his knowledge of the apotropaic power of certain materials or the ritual importance of performances such as breakage and um, the smashing or destruction of things to come up with rather different conceptualizations of what grave goods were for and how they were treated and the way in which conceptually as an archaeologist you might discern things that were done for the dead as opposed to things that were done for the living. So we've, we've spent a bit of time with Grinsell and we found him great company. Um, and uh, I was speaking to Cambridge on Monday and I was hearing about his own funeral, which incorporated many of these ideas, apparently, into the performances he wanted to see unfold um, upon his death. Um, moving into the uh, late part of the 20th century, um, of course, we see a growing interest in the symbolic power of things and their ideological importance and their use as symbols of authority and power. Um, uh, used to interpret aspects of, of status and lineage before um, post-processual archaeology uh, turns its eye on their more metaphorical qualities, perhaps. And in our own era, we felt that we're very much jostling with two different approaches here. The new interest in uh, intimate insights into the remains themselves, skeletal remains through ADNA and isotope studies, a reprioritising of human remains in the burial, and the contrastive approach from uh, symmetrical archaeology, the decentering of that person and an attention upon the more messy material amalgams of people and things and what they can tell us about um, assemblages of, uh, of identity that come together um, and are black boxed by the grave. Um, so in our approach, we've tried to kind of bring some of those approaches together to tell interesting stories of people and things, um, not quite losing 
sight of the fact that all of these begin with a death, with a bereavement, um, but trying to embrace some of those uh, new insights along the way. So when we look at things on the move, we were able to explore some of the themes that um, scholars like Joe Brook, David Fontaine, Alison Sheridan have been looking at, of course, for a, a long time. The way in which grave goods allow us to explore the material and social networks um, that are encapsulated or embodied in the things that are buried with the dead. And sometimes they have come from far away, allowing us to compose what um, Fontaine would call a kind of mapa mundi of perhaps supernatural power, cosmological relations that stretched beyond one's own um, physical kind of life or ability to voyage or journey. Um, and we were, like those other scholars, interested in the properties of those exotic things in and of themselves. But we were interested in the fact that they often don't map neatly onto the lives of uh, the people that they ended up interred with. Um, so, for example, in the Neolithic, um, we could see a low visibility of movement um, in those things compared with some of the narratives that we're hearing about mobility in those populations. And we were particularly fascinated by the um, uh, favouritism shown for the local exotic, as we called it, things that might not come from very far away, but were still important and special. Um, and that led us to re-evaluate um, the importance of jet in East Yorkshire, for example, or shale in Dorset, um, or even the humble substance of chalk um, for Iron Age um, East Yorkshire communities. Uh, so we were able to draw a contrast between those that um, those assemblages that embody extensive networks of relationships in time and space and those which were more intensive, condensing local networks of relations. That led us also to think about time in a rather different way. Um, obviously, uh, people like Joe um, and Tom Booth, uh, amongst others, have been exploring um, the stories behind some much more messy and protracted funeral rites than we have hitherto um, expected. And, and that doesn't surprise us in a period like the Neolithic, where we know the very architecture of death and burial is designed to allow a to and fro of people and things. And um, we know that some of the patterns we were seeing in our data, the objects we were finding in such mortuary contexts, may once have been associated with a body that then had been taken apart, moved around, bits taken away, rearranged. And yet some of those objects had stayed. We can no longer associate them with any particular individual, but we can recognise that they had been consigned to this mortuary realm. So although that led to more fuzzy understandings, um, uh, of uh, that relationship between people and things, um, we wanted to write about that um, in our accounts. Um, so we were able to write about burials where there were these more multi-temporal associations with things where grave goods might be much more devoted to the community. Um, and also the particular power of a cremation rite to extend mortuary time. Um, where objects might be um, placed on the pyre, become fragmented, were selectively gathered and interred, but others were added much later on in that mortuary rite. Um, and indeed, burials themselves might be disturbed and things taken away or added to them at a later date. In contrast, um, in looking at the very late Iron Age and some of those extraordinary cremations, what struck me in a burial like Welling Garden City 3 is the very short period of time, the contracted temporality expressed through these grave goods. There is no curation of objects here. There is no long lineage. They are all of the era. Um, they make the man and they were not bequeathed um, or given on to his successor. So in contrast here, I think we're looking at a cremation which is very much about the moment in time and the man himself. And perhaps here this is this is part of how funeral rites are used to make a kingly figure. Um, so that's, um, I think, where I'm going to hand over to Anwin to talk about some of the objects that we particularly wanted to bring to the light that haven't been given space before. Hello again. Um, so I wanted to discuss our work um, on understated objects because it underpins a lot of the work that we undertook more broadly on the Grave Goods Project. 
Um, it's also a topic in which grey pits from Alton play a very strong role. So I'll run through some of the key elements of this study, and I think Mel's going to chip in from time to time towards the end. So next slide, please, Mel. I want to start with an example from beyond prehistoric Britain, which emphasises the potential interpretive significance of humble objects. This excerpt is taken from Marcus Suzak's novel, The Book Thief. It's taken from a chapter in which the book's main protagonist, 13-year-old Liesel Memminger, waits over the sickbed of Max, the Jewish man who her adopted family have been hiding in their basement on the outskirts of Munich as World War II intensifies around them. Max becomes seriously ill in the winter of 1942. There's an unspoken feeling in the family that they'll soon have a corpse on their hands. As Max's condition worsens, Liesel starts to glean objects which she feels might be valuable to a dying man, or which, in case he wakes up, might be something to talk about. Beyond the objects listed here, she gathers a trampled football with flaking skin like a dead animal carcass, a feather lovely and trapped in the hinges of a church door, a lolly wrapper containing a collage of shoe prints, a piece of sky memorised and scribbled down on a piece of paper, a leaf like half a star with a stem, which somehow made its way into the school broom cupboard. Next slide, please. Not exactly grave goods, these objects could easily have become so and were in part imagined as such. Zuzak's remarkable story and the time and context, context well outside prehistoric Britain is an eloquent reminder of how the simplest things can become meaningful in times of grieving. Next slide, please. So small things uh, are a key outcome of logging all the objects formerly deposited with the dead from the Neolithic through to the end of the Iron Age. They're not usually found in museum displays. They're often separated out from more exotic aspects of grave assemblages. And they're often recorded only in passing in excavation reports. They're sometimes lost, and they're sometimes actively discarded by antiquarian and early 20th century excavators. Overall, therefore, very little is known about them. They have until recently evaded public display, general synthesis and detailed analytical attention. So the next question is, of course, how you define understated objects. And this obviously isn't an easy thing. The table on the left is our attempt to do so in um, the Grave Goods book. Um, and I think we all have different ideas about this, really. Um, and we're just going to focus on um, uh, three, three to four of these um, categories um, uh, for the rest of, of, of this section of the talk. The next slide, please. So I'm going to mention very briefly animal bone beyond bone objects. Um, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about pebbles, not just quartz. Um, then single grave goods um, is another set. And then Mel's going to talk about um, bundles of understated objects. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go into detail about animal remain grave goods, but I did want to include this slide because um, dogs in prehistoric tombs are definitely a very awkward theme. Um, and so this is a favourite slide of mine. These are um, lovely animal remain grave goods that we encountered in our case study areas. Um, and I've all, it also includes um, this uh, handwritten note which Mel encountered in her copy of uh, Mortimer's 1905 volume on prehistoric burials in um, East Yorkshire. Um, and you'll, if you can read uh, the writing, it says, souls are not lost with dogs. Next slide, please. Overall, um, with animal remain grave goods, I think the main point to take is that they're incredibly versatile. Um, they're worked into personally valued objects. They're employed in highly dramatic ceremonies. They cite imagined landscapes and alternative states of being, and they operate as cherished companions. And there's food for the living, the dead, and the supernatural alike. Next slide, please. Moving on to pebbles, which I'll look at in more detail. So these are some of the simplest objects found in prehistoric graves. Um, we found them in just over 3% of burials in the grave goods data set, and they play various roles, lining the grave, covering the body, they're mixed in with cremated remains, um, they support pottery vessels, or they're deposited as objects in their own right. 
Where the stone type is specified, this is mainly quartz or beach pebbles, but we also find chalk, jasper, sandstone, pumice, gypsum and flint nodules. Occasionally these pebbles are polished or have unusual features like natural perforation, but often they're entirely unaltered. Sometimes they're carefully placed in inhumation burials, often in the hand, and they incur in both simple and lavish graves. They've often only survived thanks to the assiduous antiquarian and early 20th century excavators and collectors, which Mel mentioned earlier, um, like John Mortimer and Leslie Grinsall, and that's John Mortimer on the left, that's like a yellowy picture. <laughs> Um, and I think an important quality of pebbles is that um, they're interpretively elusive, and this is an important quality too. Um, as Linda Cracknell said in her Radio 3 programme, the essay on 29 things that only people who collect pebbles will understand, I like the fact that no one knows that imagination is required. Next slide, please. So here are just some of the pebbles we encountered in um, the Grave Goods data set. I'll leave you a, a few seconds to have a look at them. Um, I particularly like uh, the piece of cherty rock much rubbed down on one side from Payne's Thought World Borrow for. Next slide, please, Mark. Moving on to another set of understated grave goods, um, just one thing, and this category needs a bit of explanation. Um, so almost 60% of burials in the grave goods data set included only one object. Um, and these burials are for us an important antidote to the wealthy graves that have often dominated grave goods research. They also raise some interesting questions. Are lone grave goods like these signatures of impoverished graves? Or my items um, that are deposited alone have been especially valuable. Were they prioritised over and above other objects that might have been interred? Another possibility is that object, these objects were objects that needed to be set apart from other objects at the point of deposition. And this draws on an idea that um, David Fontaine um, outlines in his recent book on hoards in, in Northern Europe. So um, the most common loan grave goods are objects for containing, covering and wrapping the dead, and this is perhaps unsurprising. Um, but we also get certain broad sets of objects, weapons and tools in particular, which were often deposited singly in the grave. And at the other end of the spectrum, um, we get certain specific objects and alls in particular that are almost never deposited singly. They need to be deposited with other things. And the last thing to say is that these graves are usually overlooked in museum displays and grave good accounts because of their um, simplicity. But in our opinion, they constitute particularly touching, personal and powerful assemblages. Next slide, please. So here's just a few of my favourite um, single lone object, uh, lone grave good burials um, in the grave good data set. I'll just sort of let you have a look at them for a minute. Next slide, please. And hand over to you, Mel, to talk about bundles. So although um, we found lots of lovely little things, um, uh, as Anwin said, sometimes we find them in little clusters. And um, just a couple of examples here to share with you. Um, we've got a burial here from Langtonwold, Langtonwold Burial 2 in East Yorkshire. Um, where Mortimer recalls that a cluster of objects was found um, in uh, such a tight gathering that he felt they must have been contained within a bag with an elderly woman. And all of these objects um, uh, were meaningfully brought together. Um, Joe Brooke and others have written about them. Um, but what we tried to do was pay serious attention to the materials from which these objects were made. It had been noted before that many of them are pierced for suspension, perhaps forming a necklace, but others weren't. And what all they all have in common is this kind of bony, platy, hard, fossiliferous texture. And one of the ideas that we've been exploring is whether this was the equivalent of a kind of medicine bundle or a gathering together of objects whose boniness or shelliness 
or fossiliferous texture um, enabled this woman to have in her possession uh, a suite of small, powerful objects that spoke of this particular quality. So we tried to think about the gathering, um, or as Jodie Joy would put it, the collecting habits of people in prehistory, and why that might mean that these particular little personal collections, again, could not be broken up and dissipated upon somebody's death. The mirror burial here from Langton Herring gives us a wonderful assemblage of glass beads, um, no Two of them are the same. This is very different to the kinds of use of glass beads in East Yorkshire during the Iron Age. Um, and it is a collection drawn from connections that span not just Dorset itself. We have some chalk beads and a fossiliferous um, bead from uh, Purbeck. But we also have glass beads that probably came from the Channel Islands or Gaul itself. And they were probably strung together um, in a meaningful collection that may have hung at her waist or even have tied a tassel around the bag that protected her mirror. And right in amongst them, we also find this little reworked coin amulet with a picture of a female charioteer on. So we tried to think about the meaningful gathering together of small bundles and the way in which they too demanded interpretation or imagination, um, but that their exact meaning, again, would probably always escape us. And then we started thinking about the way in which such small things, uh, under, understated as they were, um, might have been deeply meaningful as grave goods, that these kinds of things that were highly portable, that were highly idiosyncratic, that may have been worn, that may have spoken of somebody's biography, were um, not just talismans or amulets, as they've been described in the past, but perhaps things that the dead would really not want to be without. Um, they are often handled and worn and loved, and therefore that notion that they are given over to be with the dead, I think, is a significant one. And we drew here upon some of our anthropology in relation to personal objects like glasses that, again, are so idiosyncratic to the dead that they can't be um, bequeathed or handed on. So we tried to use some of these objects to talk about the relations of the deceased, um, that these were not grand gifts or gestures, but perhaps brought us closer to the identity of the dead um, and spoke about the care and respect with which they were being interred with things that were powerful and meaningful to them. Right, I'm going to hand back to Anwin at this stage. So I think we should rattle through this uh, very quickly uh, because much as I'd like to talk more about grave goods from Orkney, the Outer Hebrides and, and Scotland, uh, we'd also like to talk about the Boundary Objects Project. So Mel, if you um, just skip through the next three slides and you can all imagine um, what I was going to say about them. <laughs> I think the main thing that I wanted to say about grave goods from Orkney, the Outer Hebrides and across Scotland, um, they've played a huge role in what we've done on the Grave Goods Project. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to say is that they're very thought provoking. Um, and although they're numerically diminutive in our in our data set, um, they've actually had a huge interpretive role. Um, here's some of my favourites. And if you go on to the next slide, Mel. The main things that I got out of um, these burials is that although we do get these glamorous early Bronze Age burials like the Nails of Trotty and Doombie and Orkney, um, there are also many understated objects, polished pebbles, limpet shells and simple pendants um, in Orkney and the Outer Hebrides. And we get graves and objects that challenge understandings of what grave goods are, like disarticulated human and animal bodies or middle, middle material in a kist. So, as I said, there's not many, but they've, they, they pack a punch uh, interpretively of, with work on the Grave Goods Project. So, next slide, please. So, moving on to the Boundary Objects Project. Um, next slide. So this is an AHRC follow on funding for impact and engagement project. Um, it began in April last year and um, it runs for one year. Um, and it's a collaboration uh, between uh, many of the uh, 
people on the Grave Goods Project, um, and also our partners in Scotland, Hugo, um, who you all know, and Leanne McCafferty at Historic Environment Scotland. Next slide. Um, the three main starting points for this project. The first is grave goods themselves, who are, which are particularly poignant and prominent objects. Um, they're widely significant and well understood and have different meanings for different sets of people. And importantly, they play a huge part in the public imagination of the past. Um, and Mel did a survey at the British Museum while we were doing the grave goods project. And she found that about 50% of objects in the European prehistory galleries there um, were, are grave goods, even though it's not always obvious to visitors that this is what they are. So overall, they're powerful points of connection for diverse sources of information and sets of people past and present. Next slide, please. The second starting point for the Boundary Objects Project um, was disjointed grave goods information. And this is a, the case everywhere, not at all just in Scotland. Um, so just to give you an example um, from Orkney, um, this is a handwritten note that accompanied an urn, human remains and a slate lid um, that are in Stromness Museum. Um, and this note featured on the, the, the website. Um, but interestingly, the equivalent record in Canmore um, states that the urn cannot be located. And this is something we came across again and again when we were doing research for the Grave Goods project, that it was often very difficult to piece together bits of information from online information to um, what's, what's in published information and from arch archival material. It was often contradictory and difficult to, um, to get our hands on. And that seemed to be a, a, an important area to try to work on. Next slide, please. Um, a third starting point was the rarity of opportunities for volunteers um, to work with archaeological finds. Um, so despite the fact that grave goods are so popular, it's quite hard um, for people to, um, the, the, the general public, to work with this set of objects. Next, please. So the Boundary Objects Project set out to build a simple tool for linking disjointed data about objects in their context of discovery. Next, please. Um, to explore new ways of involving Scottish volunteers in finds related work. Next slide. Um, to experiment, we're not trying to solve um, these problems because uh, there's a lot of work to be done, um, but just to try out different ideas um, to make uh, object uh, information more accessible. And last one, uh, we wanted to think forward. So we wanted to generate ideas to see how we could sustain um, improvements in object information flow and to build on the find volunteering opportunities we did for this project. Next slide, please. So here's the first output, um, the finds hub, which you can uh, go and explore yourselves. Um, so this is our tool for linking uh, object records about objects um, in mainly in the National Museum of Scotland, also in the uh, University of Aberdeen Museum, um, and site records, um, both on Canmore and in historic environment records from uh, Northern Scotland. Next slide, please. I'll hand over to Hugo here, um, who can tell you a bit more about the um, opportunities to have a look at George Petrie's notebooks. Yes. So. Um... It's worth saying, actually, in relation to the last um, slide, the finds hub, is that do go on the website and do have a go at trying to link some of the sites, the, the museum objects back to the sites. Um, it takes a few minutes to get to, to grips with that task. Um, there are a number of how to videos which which help explain it. But um, once you've once you've once you've got the first one done, you can really um, get behind in quite start making links quite rapidly but it's a it's a really exciting project and an opportunity to really supply links back and actually make those connections and we're, we're finding sort of quite interesting links and stories of objects by doing that so um yeah do have a go and do get in touch if you if you find yourself having any issues with it as well because um once you get started well you can get get a lot done and it, it's really interesting so we've got um in addition to the task of linking the sites um, and objects back together we're also doing a few sort of ancillary projects and one of them is um george petrie's notebooks so these are in the library at national museum of scotland and the library has been busy scanning these um there's still a couple more to go and uh they're being made available just as scans on our museum's Flickr account so if you go to National Museum of Scotland, you'll find an al album for each one of those notebooks. 
But one of the things we really want to do is have those transcribed um, and uh, to make that data more accessible by being able to search, search the text um, and identify the images. So I'll come back to that task in a minute, but many of you know George Petrie um, through his sort of excavations in the 19th century. He was a prolific excavator in Orkney. Uh, he excavated uh, Scarabray, Mays Howe, uh, Coy Ness on Sandy. He excavated numerous brocks. Um, and these notebooks really, they're jottings about those excavations. They often don't have a huge amount of text, but they're full of wonderful illustrations of the sites and the objects. And they vary from measured plans to sketches of objects. And what's really interesting is there are, particularly for the artifacts, there's little additional bits of information in there that are helping us um, identify these objects, get better provenances. So this uh, mace head you can see at the top here, that's passed into the hands of James Walls Cursiter. It's in the Hunterian now, but the little provenance here is the best provenance you'll find for that object saying where it was actually found. And similarly, this sketch in the middle here, we know that the two bone dye, possibly bead making debris, you can see those at Scarabray Visitor Center, they're in National Museum Scotland's collection. But this ax in the middle here, that's in Orkney Museum. And it's a really fascinating one because you can see it's been turned into a weight at a later date. So there's, there's lots of sketches and it's trying to find out where those objects have ended up and, and enrich our sort of stories relating to those. So next slide. So how you can help us is um, by tagging and transcribing these notebooks on the Micropast website. So Micropast was set up by the British Museum uh, to transcribe some of their uh, metalwork cards a few years ago, and it's diversified into sort of all sorts of heritage projects. And so we've been working with them to set up um, these notebooks as a way, as a, as a project, uh, transcription project for us. So we sort of blended this, there's a lot of image tabbing here, tagging here in that you would draw a box around an image and describe what's there, and then also transcribing the jottings about it on the page to actually uh, give that information about it. And again, these are fascinating. It's sort of like there's some pages which just have little jottings, amusing things um, that George Petrie observed, some work notes, some really interesting excavation notes, but real insights into his personality as well. So they're a valuable thing. We're really pleased that they're becoming more accessible. And with your help, once we've once the public and you know anyone who has had an opportunity to transcribe these has finished these notebooks, all of that information will be available and searchable online. So it's a real, it's a real great way of making these things more accessible because they're not in a really logical order at the moment. So it does need that help in tagging each one so that we find things. But next slide. Um, this is just a brief slide. Uh, shall I hand back to you, Anwin, to say a little bit about the Death Cafe? It's another sort of project which has been going on as part of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll take actually, this actually I was sorry, I was, I was, I was going to hang, hang back to Mel, but before, oh, okay, um, sorry. before, I, uh, before I do, I was just going to say um, that uh, Mel, Hugo and I are very much hoping um, to run workshops um, on Orkney with um, UHI Orkney and also with Orkney Archaeology Society um, to go through, um, run through the tasks on the Finds Hub and the George, the Micropass John, George Petrie notebook tasks. Um, and Mel talked to you more about the Ancient Death Cafe now, which is another initiative. Yeah, so um, in a previous project with Karina Croucher, um, we used um, a kind of version of the phenomenon of the Death Cafe, which some of you may have heard of, um, set up as a way of encouraging a more holistic and healthy conversation around the dead and uh, a way of normalising loss and bereavement. Um, and we decided to uh, use that in Karina's project as a way of engaging people with archaeological artefacts and stories that help them reflect on their own experiences. So um, quite organically, faced with the challenges of COVID and not being able to actually go out and do the face-to-face -face workshops we planned, 
Anwin and I, um, with Hugo occasionally at our side, um, have been running what we've called the Ancient Death Cafe, an informal get together every month um, of people who are engaged in creating uh, stories, uh, making links between these data records through the Finds Hub, but also beginning to piece together um, longer reads for Canmore as a way of uh, trying to do some of the the kinds of tasks that we did in the original project, finding the stories behind the things buried with the dead. And we found that that has worked very organically and um, supportively to uh, help network people, to find stories out there we didn't know about, to connect people with records and with expertise, um, but also to develop that storytelling um, that we want to see come out of the project. I mean, do you want to speak to this one or? Oh, well, yeah, I, I could do that. So, um, so yeah, the, the main outputs of, 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 um, that we're hoping to get uh, from these ancient death cafes is um, these long reads, about 1500 words with images, um, which will be put on the Canmore website. Um, and they're along the lines of the current Archaeology Insights Initiative. Um, and we're also helping people put together grant applications for future community led research projects. Next slide, please. Um, so here are some of the diverse starting points um, that we've used to build new stories about grave digs in Scotland. Um, and I'm going to now hand over to Hugo, who will finish us off um, and tell us about um, his own uh, long read, uh, which started off uh, with some fragmentary, fragmentary textiles from a Bronze Age kist burial at First Park, Stromness. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so um, so yeah, there's lots of different stories. It's things that have caught people's imaginations. Um, next slide, and, Matt. Sorry, yes. So next slide, yes. So um, the one I've I've I, I'm talking about is uh, some textiles, plant textiles that were found at, at First Park, uh, south end of Stromness, and this is a, a really good example of the benefit we get when we connect the two data sets together because the reason when i was going through our own collections i i was looking at this this entry for a piece of textile and i didn't recognize the the site in stromness and so a quick search on canmore and there are no kists in that area so this is an object a burial that has never made it onto the historic environment record and so it was a it was a prime object to research um and what's really interesting you look at this look at this textile you can see how neatly woven it is there have been reports on it in uh, audrey henshaw wrote about it in the 50s um about as a plant textile but the actual find has been entirely forgotten so next slide um the little bit of information we had to go on was that it was found or James Walls Kirsten had donated it in 1911 to the museum. And there was reference to a newspaper article. So the Orcadian search through the British newspaper archive threw up this wonderful information. And, you know, the way antiquarian um, uh, or uh, writings in the past in papers were often sort of really like short, short archaeological reports. So we see a really... Uh, interesting description of this discovery giving all the information you might information you might expect in a modern report about the orientation of the kist uh the the, the way it was discovered um and we see a, a lovely story in this about a house being constructed a kist being opened there's the excitement of the discovery all of the various antiquaries in the area descend to have a look at this and it, it's seemingly a burial of a, a female individual, a poorly preserved skeleton. But the exciting thing is this covering of this textile over the body with what they describe as a sort of different um, thin bark or wood covering over over the skull. So no grave goods in this at all, but a very careful plant material, something you wouldn't normally get preserved um, over, the, over that uh, body. The one thing in the, the paper doesn't describe is actually where it is. The house didn't have a name at that time. But subsequent searches over who was building a house there reveals that this is Red Roof in Stromness. So the actual kist was under the north boundary wall of the site. So we can know within a few metres where this actually this kist was. So it's a good example of this works from 
an object that was just in a museum, but connecting it up and doing that research um, revealed that this wasn't on Canmore. And it's something that now we can enrich that data set with this new information. So this is really what we want to get richer stories about these objects. So um, and being able to sort of connect and enhance the enhance our, our sort of knowledge of our, our landscapes around us. So um, there's lots more objects like this. If you start digging, you will find loads of them, um, which, uh, which have stories you can find out a lot more about. They're certainly, it's not all written in one place. So that's the fun of being able to, to research, these, uh, research these objects. So um, I'll hand back there. I think we're reaching the end of our talk. We have reached the end of our talk. So there's lots of thanks to different people. Um, there's been many different people involved in the original project. In the current um, project, we've worked with uh, many different uh, HERs, museums, uh, people from different sectors. And so I'm not going to name them all. They're all listed there. But I will say on behalf of us, it's a pleasure talking to you today. Do get in touch if you want to get involved with what we're working on at the moment, because it's uh, it's uh, we're finding it quite exciting and engaging. So we're I think we're happy to take questions, aren't we? Thank you very, very much. I'll applaud on behalf of everybody. Jane is applauding too. <laughs> yeah, there have been a few questions coming in the Q&A section. Um, can I just check first, what should people do if they want to get involved, for example, by um, transcribing the notebooks or tagging image or any of those tasks that you describe? If people out there are sitting thinking, oh, I want to do this, what should they do? Well, uh, if you put for the MicroPass one, if you put in MicroPasts and go and look at their projects under British, one of them is a featured project, but there's lots of the notebooks under the British prehistory section. Um, you can pick one and you sign up and you start transcribing it. Um, for the Finds Hub, if you go to finds-hub.org, um, again, if you just search Finds Hub, it comes up. And again, register watch the how-to videos, and uh, you can start straight away from there. They're all up and ready to go. And uh, yeah, and then just contact us if you have any, any further questions about it. But they're all up, and up online and ready to, ready to go. That sounds good. But there will be a workshop coming up on Anwen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was also going to say, if you go to the Boundary Objects Project um, website, which is um, hosted by the University of Reading, um, all of the initiatives from the project are summarised there in one place. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you can find that if you Google Boundary Objects Project. <laughs> I know you're planning a workshop with the Orkney Archaeology Society too, though, to get people involved. We'll be hear more about that in due course, I hope. Yeah, so we, I think we're just setting a date for that um, at the minute. And uh, I think we're provisionally going to do a workshop um, at UHI Orkney on the 4th of March, is it, Mel? Yes, all being well. Super. Look Why forward to that. Fly up there, yeah. Cool, in person even, even better. Okay, Jane, would you like to come in first before we go to Q&A? Yes, thank you, um, Jane. Um, that was really, really interesting. I can't wait to read the book um, and I've been keeping up with um, all the exciting developments of the project. It's really fascinating. It's great to hear about it. Um, I just uh, will um, just maybe abuse the privilege of appearing on screen and ask a question. Um, obviously, that you know, there's going to be lots to look at in the book to do with this, but I just wondered if you had to give um, any key findings of what, what you would say defines the particular areas in relation to the Bronze Age, particularly, say, this local exotic material what would you say for each case study area was a material that defined that or wasn't found elsewhere or is is it not that clear cut oh that's a tricky one for each of the case study areas. Just some of them. <laughs> just... you can search that jane in the database <laughs> um oh. i think i think what we've tried to do you know that there are 
that I think that would be quite difficult to say, oh, oh yes, actually, from this analysis, new things popped out that we didn't expect. But but certainly shells, shells and pebbles, though, you know, as Anwin did a lot of research on that in the early Bronze Age. And of course, you know, people have written about those before, but it was the um you know, I, I don't. They don't get the attention they deserve, particularly in a museum context. So that made us rethink the importance, particularly where they're the, the only thing there. Um, and also in the Iron Age, you know, they just get chucked away. So, um, so particularly in places like Dorset and East Yorkshire, where you get these iron pyrites nodules, um, where they're just dismissed, as Anwin said, as ecofax. It's it's natural. It's a piece of natural in the chalk, and and the antiquarians know that they could be used as a striker light. The workmen are still using them, you know, but but they just get conceptually carved off, thrown away, um, and and all we're relying on there is that little hint in the account. So, um, uh, but for the Bronze Age, Anwin, do you did you want to talk a little bit more? I mean, sandstone lids in the Middle Bronze Age, in Dorset. That, yeah, that was... I, I think I was, I mean, we know that um, the Middle Bronze Age in Dorset is, 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 is perhaps the only place um, where, you, or it, I think I think we knew that there was a sort of focus of Middle Bronze Age burial um, practices in Dorset, um, but I hadn't realised before doing the Graveyards Project how extreme that was and how extremely different it was to the whole of the rest of, all, all of the rest of our case study areas. Um, and uh, really, you know, yeah. So, so I mean, it's 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 the pots, but also the lids. Um, and uh, one thing that I really like about the the, the pots in Middle Bronze Age Dorset is you get quite a lot of mend holes, um, and that's a feature of the Middle Bronze Age in Dorset in particular. And it's quite often clustered at certain cemeteries. Um, so it's it's almost like they're picking out these objects that are broken and almost sort of baggy when they're putting them in the grave. Um, but actually, it's a feature of the earlier Bronze Age in Orkney and uh, in Gwynedd. Um, so, um, so people are interested in in sort of mended pots um, in certain places and at certain times. So that that's one Bronze Age pattern that I really liked. Anyway, thank you. Um, we are already over time, but there were some questions in the Q and A that I would like to put to you if you can stay a few minutes yeah. longer. Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll take the first one, the Neil Price idea that what we're looking at is um the the stage at the end of Hamlet. And I think um obviously I'm not we're not the first people to write about this, but um people like Howard Williams have have, have written uh, in contrast to to that notion that what we're looking at is a tableau. We may be looking at grave goods performances that create moments of stillness that are tableaus for people to gaze at and 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 watch but that would be to ignore the all the play that's leapt up that's led up to that moment which itself is an unfolding of of, of dramatic and then still moments so what we were able to do is is to try and write into being the sense of things that had come and gone and, and again we used our anthropology there when we look at mortuary rites we learn that people sometimes put things in the grave for a while and then they disappear again. Um, and sometimes that disappearance is much, much later. People come back into the grave and and take things out or put things back in. So, yes, there are, you know, there are graves like the Welling Garden City 3 that look like a stage set. And I think you can literally, you know, we've got things propped up and stacked and arranged colour coded, actually, at Welling Garden City 3 and clustered in in groups. But the moment that that was there was only one moment in that performance. And and um, I can see there's another question there about organic objects. Sometimes what we were pointing out was the spaces where we felt there had clearly been things, but there were no trace of them because of the preservation conditions. And there are those other moments where we can see some of those organics. So our database could sometimes capture that, but at other times we had to kind of write that into being in terms of some some absences um, and some spaces and some sense of things that have gone on stages in performance that were no longer reflected, but we could see had happened. Um, and for me, the model there was the account of the Brisley Farm Warriors by Stevenson, where he creates that um, the table of the performances that have ended up with that final burial. And all those stages in that performance are beautifully evoked and all the material conditions and kind of acts and people that must have come together around them 
are, are evoked for the reader, even though they have not necessarily left a material trace in the grave. So in the monograph, we are, yes, using the database, but then using the narrative space to do more work around the things that we can't see in the data. I hope I hope that captures some of our ambition, Anwin. Yeah, um, shall I go through? There's, a, there's three sort of quick questions after that, which I could go through. <laughs> um, linking Orkney and the Outer Hebrides, um, I think it, it, it is interesting, um, but uh, as you all know, I think there's a sort of movement to, um, <laughs> to look at um, archaeology across um, the northern Scottish islands. Um, I think it's quite interesting the way that the evidence from um, Orkney and the Outer Hebrides plays off against uh, one another. Uh, so just to give you a couple of quick examples, we were, to, uh, uh, I think uh, we were looking at um, uh, Langdale uh, stone axes um, with Mark Edmonds the other day. Um, and it's interesting because they do occur on Orkney and when well, we weren't sure if they occurred on the Outer Hebrides, but they do as well. Um, and the, so so that's that's something interesting, you know, that, that, that connects the two places, um, the, the, these things from um, from Cumbria, we're getting to both of them. But also, um, if you go back to the Neolithic, um, I think it's interesting because uh, the assemblages from tombs, as has been pointed out from a long time for a long time um, on Orkney, are very difficult. It's very difficult to unpick the relationships between um, people and the objects in Neolithic tombs. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that on the uh, so in on in North Uist at Univall, um, uh, you get this uh, sort of exceptionally preserved um, Neolithic tomb where you get uh, a, a sort of well, firstly it's 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 very well preserved secondly it was um very well excavated and thirdly you get very patterned pract practice um that shows that there probably were grave goods in neolithic tombs at least at this site at, at, at least at unival um but then then they were moved around and they had much longer histories after the initial burial with the body and then that makes us start to reflect on the evidence in orkney um, where you don't get that preservation necessarily. Um, so I think you can, it, they're, they're, they're good um, case studies to link up. So yeah, that wasn't a very quick answer, but that's that one. We did look at cremated, cremated human remains as well as um, in inhumations. That's another question from Robert um, Barker. And the other thing I was gonna say is the, the sharp boundaries on the heat map. Um, I don't know, Mel, do you wanna go back up to the, the heat map? Yeah, we'll, I'll um, click through. It does need a bit of explaining this diagram. Um, so what we did is um, we split uh, our entire study period into a hundred year time slices. Um, and we worked out uh, the probability of objects belonging to those hundred year time slices. And what that means is you sort of get a better representation of the occurrence of stuff over your entire study period. Um, so the sharp boundaries are the end of an 100 year time slice, and that's why it looks blocky. Um, obviously, you could blur that if you want to, and obviously it's a bit of an artificial construction, but it is the, 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 they are quite steep curves, even if you try to blur these, um, these, these boundaries. So I hope that explains that a bit better. <laughs> and, and the last then, question is about uh, communal versus discrete single burials no we we looked at at anything that was associated with the dead so as Anwin's evoked we looked at those even though it was messy and difficult data we did look at communal tombs and we tried to see whether we could see relationships between things and people and where we couldn't discern that exact relationship as Anwin said we've been writing about the the fact that those architectural spaces allow for these objects to have a kind of a, a much longer itinerary and temporality and yet they don't lose that mortuary meaning and association but they get reconfigured um uh likewise in you know in in the bronze age late bronze age and kind of iron age period if you're dealing with multiple burials again we we dealt with them if they had grave goods in um so uh you know sometimes we could we could see from the records 
which body things have been placed on, but sometimes we're dealing with a kind of a dual association or uh, an assemblage that had a, a meaning, you know, Cliffs End Farm, for example, in Kent, where we've got a number of bodies with very different mortuary histories that end up in the same pit together. Um, and we've got the very charismatic old lady uh, who's been clocked on the head with her pebble pressed to her mouth. Um, so, yes, so definitely we did look across those kinds of messy uh, mortuary assemblages. And so I think I'm, I'm hoping that whereas the data had to sometimes fit within certain categories, um, you know, it was through the power of, of, of the wit and wizardry of people like Chris Green through our visualisation that we've really pushed ways to kind of interrogate that data and show its messiness and our conceptual articles admit to that messiness and talk about it and and even, you know, and blur those boundaries where we felt that needed doing. Um, and so the book gave us also the space to talk about some of that ambiguity. So I hope when you've 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 unfolded some of those narratives, you'll you'll understand more of the messiness in the project, um, and but also that that is telling us sometimes some really important things. Brilliant. Um, I think it's time to end now. Thanks for all the good questions, everyone. And I think we can echo what Karenza Murray is saying here. She says, fantastic presentation, guys. Hats off to everyone involved. So thank you so much again. And I'll stop recording now.